Welcome to the Painting Insights podcast. We have been working on something in the background. That's right. We've actually started a Patreon channel. For the last couple of months, we've had previous guests revisit the channel to give us additional content, everything from studio tours, sketchbook tours, talking us through the process of paintings and all kinds of additional treats, which you're exclusively going to see as a patron who supports the channel. So by supporting us on Patreon, you help the channel keep going. There's a lot of work put into this from the video editing to the sourcing of guests. So you really help us find those guests and to put the content out. And we have lots of uh, content planned for the near future. So the links for that will be in the description of this video and in the description on the podcast channels. And otherwise you can go on to Patreon and type in Painting Insights Podcast and support us that way. Thanks very much, enjoy the video. Would you introduce yourself for the audience, please? Yeah, my name is John Wentz. I'm a painter currently living in Oakland, California, just outside of San Francisco. Um, currently, I say because I travel quite a bit. I just re Well, no, I always said just returned, but I was in Paris for five years. Um, so I was out of the States for a while and then returned back here, but still have done a lot of traveling. So for now, I'm in Oakland. Wow. So did you have a... A kind of do you have somewhere to go back to Paris is that something that where it's your home that you return to or is it just part of a kind of nomadic nature that you seem to have it turned uh into a nomadic thing uh I had to leave I left uh, during COVID I had to come back here for some family stuff um so I had to get rid of my place there my intention was to go back but it's just kind of turned into this nomadic thing. And I recently just got back from two months in Mexico. So that kind of shifted my plans where I always thought I would go back to France, but I kind of fell in love with Mexico. So I think I'll be spending more time there. That sounds fantastic. I mean, has this always been the case or is it is it only post COVID you started traveling or did you always travel quite well uh, in younger years? I think I always traveled. Yeah, I always had the the wanderlust. Like it started with when I was younger, like I drove all around the U.S. Um, I think also I used to play uh, music, playing bands, like punk bands and stuff. And um, so we did touring around the U.S. So that kind of ignited it, too. And then it just kind of grew from there. Amazing. What was your band name? The last band I was in was called uh, The Influence. Uh, played in a lot of different bands here in um so where i'm at in oakland it's i don't know if you know the geography but so berkeley is right next to it mm -hmm. and berkeley there's a his, kind of i call it a historic place um punk club called gilman 924 gilman and it's where so i mean there's so many bands in this area and it spawned like Bands like Green Day, Neurosis, um, Bikini Kill. Well, no, Bikini Kill didn't start out of there, but they got big there. Uh, Jawbreaker, like so many bands. Rancid, Rancid came out of there, Operation Ivy. So playing in bands, if you lived in this area, it was just something you did. Like everybody had a band. Mm. A yeah. lot of them, a lot of bands. <laughs> well, lots of uh, healthy uh, history, really, for... Punk music is it's something which I've got a deep connection to. My first gig that okay. I went to was No Effects. Um, so I, nice. I loved it. You know, it was really fun. And obviously, they're quite a playful band. And I loved Rancid always. So, yeah, fantastic. Uh, that's I cool. Yeah. And I, sorry, I'm going to switch it quick. But where are you out of? I don't even know where you're. I'm in Wales. Uh, oh, okay. So, you know, it's next to England, but it's uh, one of yeah. the Celtic countries, you know, because Scotland, Ireland and Wales are all Celtic and England yeah. is so yeah I'm in North Wales so it's beautiful countryside I'm right on the beach um so it's lovely but I went to Manchester for the performance of uh no effects and cool. that's where a lot of my family is from is Manchester if they're not from Italy they're from Manchester so um I'd go there quite often I went to Manchester again recently it's a really good music culture in Manchester and a uh, beautiful city so yeah that's where nice. I'm that is a place I have not been it's on my list I recommend it. For some reason, people in the country, in the UK, don't 
it doesn't have a great reputation, but I think it's the best city in the country. Either that or Edinburgh, they're both amazing. Old Liverpool, they're all northern yeah. cities. They're all amazing, you know. Um, but anyway, what's your what's your kind of history and background for anyone who doesn't know you of art? How did you like? When did you start practicing art, and how did you get to where you are now? Um, I always use the the answer that is like I never stopped. Like it's everybody does it as a kid, like pretty much everybody, but most people stop. Mm -hmm. So I just continued. I never stopped drawing. So I was that kid that was always drawing in class or drawing on your books and drawing in pages. And um, although my concentrations have shifted, like I said, I went to music for a bit and this and that. Um, but I think it really hit. I don't I want to say probably used to work at a record store yeah that's when i think i started taking it seriously and was getting paid for it was uh, i was working at a record store and we had to replicate album covers you do it with airbrush so um i weaseled my way into that uh that job just totally lied said i had like you know because it was all airbrush i'd never used an airbrush so i just lied and said yeah i've been doing it for years and they just bought it so yeah. it was trial by fire and um, I just taught myself to do it. And then there was that. And then um, I always drew comics, even as a kid. I was a big comic book fan. Mm. So it was between those two things. Um, oh, really? Yeah, that, that was a start. And then at some point, um, I had a, one of my best friends. Yeah, we were in a band together, this terrible garage band. And um, he started going to art school. And for some reason, it was just something that, it never really occurred to me. Like I, I thought like art schools were just all gone conceptual mm. and he was a very good, uh, kind of more of an illustrator. And I remember after like six months or eight months, I saw some of his work and he started oil painting and it was just phenomenal. I was blown away how good he was and how much he'd progressed. And to me, like I really thought oil painting was a thing of the past, you know, um, so I got hooked. I went to class with him. He let me tail him for like a day or a couple of days at the school. And then uh, I signed up like after that and went to art school. Yeah, because I, I can see that as much as you obviously have this free expression with kind of blowing things out into abstraction, which is amazing. And I always love seeing that. It's really nice to see that you've got this um, fundamentals of, of art and, um, you know, all the foundational skills kind of learnt deeply was that something that you got at art school or did you already have a good grasp of portraiture and and kind of you know form and color and light um yeah i think so i i from just doodling my entire life like uh, you get pretty good because i normally like everybody you draw faces right it's the first thing that's our connection so i'd always done that but i think what art school taught me was the medium like how how to use oil and then certain things that i didn't quite understand like getting used to like color mixing and understanding color a little bit better um or getting better at working from life that was things i learned from art school but it, it it's a you know there was a, a a bad side to it too that i see with a lot of people and it happened to me where um i got lost in the academia of it to where like I was joke around and says like yeah, I, you get to a point where because uh, anyone who's gone to art school have, have you, did you go to art school so everybody draws the naked man with the stick right <laughs> like, <laughs> they were drawing class and you some people you get to a point where you think that is art mm. naked and that's where I got and I completely lost myself I just I and I remember like um, a friend like I was super proud of these paintings and a friend came over to my work and she said wow you guys really like naked people and it was very eye-opening to me because that that's the observer that's the audience and that's how she saw it and i was like oh my god i've completely got lost in the academics of it and i kind of had i don't know if it was a complete existential crisis but it, i had a breakdown about it it was very depressing wow well how did you then find your way into things of your own preference beyond how art school can really influence you and imprint upon your direction through art? How did you actually find your way out of that? There were two things. I 
I had one instructor. So I went to the Academy of Art in San Francisco. It's a very, very technical school, which is fantastic. But there there was one instructor who was kind of like the black sheep there, who was kind of he he's kind of a contrarian, which worked great. So he kind of started pushing back at like leaving, not breaking the rules. You know, it's like that, like jazz. You learn the rules and break the rules, learn the scales, then forget the scales. But also there there was one serendipitous moment. I remember like at, at school, I just had, I think that's where I had the breakdown one day of just like realizing like, oh my God, I'm just painting naked people. And um, I was walking back from class and the route went past the MoMA in San Francisco, I said MoMA. And they just happened to be having a full retrospective of Gerhard Richter. And I fell in, Richter was one of my early uh, early influences when I was a kid, but I thought it was all photography because it was just his photo real work. Like I, I was introduced to his work with the Sonic Youth cover, Daydream Nation. They had the candles. Yeah. And so I was like, man, that guy's a great photographer. Like I, I didn't know any better. And, um, you know, I, then I saw his abstract work and blah, blah, blah. But so I'm walking past the moment and they have this full retrospective and it's like, I think as a student it was five bucks to get in. So I was like, hey man, I'm going to check it out. And I was in there all day until closing because every floor was Richter's work and it just spans it was a full retrospective. And that like changed my view. And even when I talk about it, I get excited. Like it just ignited me, like all his creativity, like he knew how to paint, but he, you know, he was doing photorealism and then he's doing these abstractions and then he's doing these things with the, um, he did the series with uh, color charts and all these things. And there was technique there and there was creativity and there was an intention and concept. And it just completely blew my mind and brought me back to where I wanted to be. That's great. Yeah, that's really good. That's a deep influence. I mean, I was going to actually ask as well, because this is on audio platforms as well as on YouTube, how would you describe your artwork for anyone who isn't able to see it? And I always have a hard time with that. I just, uh, I generally it depends who it is like if it's somebody that's like a collector or really doesn't know art i just say like abstracted uh, or expressive figurative work mm. you know but yeah. um it, yeah that's probably my generalized thing that's i mean did you ever end up doing album covers for any of your bands because i could see it translating quite easily there I have, but they're very bad, so I'm not going to say what bands they were, <laughs> but I have. <laughs> fair enough. That would have been my next question. Is can you <laughs> Yeah, I know. So. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But it is something I want to get back into because I've, I've also um, recently got, the last year, gotten into uh, uh, screen printing again. Mm. And um, I'm really obsessed with album covers. Like I've gone back to collecting vinyls. It's nice to see that big boom in vinyls. Yeah. And I see a, a good vinyl packaging as like the ultimate artwork. Mm. Uh, it's one of my goals to get back into that. Yeah. I, when I did a Midwest uh, road trip in, in America in 2009, I went to a thrift store and I ended up getting a load of I've got up there a load of vinyl. Um, in fact, that's only some of it, actually. No, it must be. I thought it was all up there. I must have some in boxes somewhere else, but I ended up bringing them back in suitcases and being overweight, you know, and having to uh, pay the extra toll because it's, <laughs> I just couldn't leave behind, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it has that different quality to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if I could actually... Do you have a, a specific color palette that you use, like one which you stick to? And if you do, would you mind taking us through what those colors are? Oh, sure. But I have kind of a generalized one. Um, let me see what I usually use. Like in umbers, I use burnt umber and raw umber, uh, titanium white. Um, and then for more earth tones, like I'll use an ochre, yellow ochre. Sometimes I use raw sienna just because so, I like the transparency. So if it's like something in shadows or something, or you're glazing, that's a good one. Um, burnt sienna, cad red light. Lately, I've been using like a medium, a red medium. And then alizarin, ultramarine blue. Um, oh, one of my favorites. Uh and I've only found it in Sennelier. It's called Bonnard Blue, and it's kind of a cerulean. It's a bit different, 
Uh, it's one of my favorites because with cad red light, it, it makes the most amazing grays like that. Whenever I that's my base palette. But whenever I lay out anything else, my first thing is always like, what? How do I make grays? Like, where are my grays? And that's my favorite because you can shift from like a cool violet to a warm violet gray with those two colors. And then uh, Viridian. I think that's kind of my standard. And then uh, I'd like to try out new things or depending on what the painting is, I'll add you know, new color, like maybe I had like a cad yellow if I need to brighten something or a cad orange or yeah. whatever the dog he was going to be in the painting. Is that something that you developed when you were in uh, art school? Because it sounds, unless I misunderstood, it sounds like a split primary with some earth tones and then Viridian green. Am I th am I right that you've kind basically, of... Basically, got... yeah, basically it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what uh, you developed in school. No, not really. I think... The our palettes is called actually it was mostly like at school was Terra Rosa. What did we use? It, very limited palettes like Terra Rosa. I think the ultramarine I got from there, maybe the ochre and like burnt umber. Um, but it varied depending on the teacher. But for school, I don't think I really learned color well in school. I'd had to do a lot. That was another thing that after school, I spent another two years because one th great thing about school is it what it should do is teach you how to teach yourself. And I think that's what I got the most out of it from some great teachers. But I remember leaving and still not really understanding much. So then I spent the next couple of years like studying composition. That was something we were never taught, except for, you know, you're never taught what to do. You're taught what not to do, like avoid the center, don't do tangents. But you're like, how do you compose with negatives? You know, like, um, and color was another one. So I spent a lot of time, um, just self-studying color afterwards so that is a bit of a challenge it was a question that i was weighing up whether to ask you or not because it almost feels unfair to ask some people because it's such an a hard uh subject to try and explain but since you brought it up how do you approach composition and how would you is there any kind of advice you could put out there for anyone who is starting to make art and struggling with how to compose on the picture plane you know, anything which they would like to be impactful? Um, I mean, the first thing, I, and I think is the best thing is to learn, like l l figure out, well, first find the paintings you like and figure out the compositions, but also even if you don't like the works, I always recommend like um, look to the great composers. You know, Diebenkorn was, was amazing. Or um, man, why can't I remember his name now? I'm, fully embarrassed the cake painter uh it's too early my coffee's still kicking in it'll come to i'm not thinking it. but look look at those painters and do like you know first i would always do like black and white uh thumbnails like just straight black straight white look at the values then figure out what they're doing um and then aside from that like in a more academic way th this i always found to be it's controversial with artists and i hate using the term sacred geometry um, but I always recommend, I spent probably too many years reading about sacred geometry. I take it with a grain of salt. You know, it's one of those things like the, it, it's love or hate I found. And like the people who are really into it, it's like, that's what all the great masters use. They knew the direct geometry of everything, which I don't quite believe. And then you got the others on the side of like, man, it's just a cult. There's an in between, and and what I th what I think is like you use it as scaffolding. It helps you to see paintings differently. So I would look at like the books that I'd read, and people I know that are into it. They would tell me the artists that they think would definitely be using it, like um, Corbet or uh, Chagall or Picasso, all these other artists, and just study it. And I would lay over sacred geometry charts and be like, okay, that kind of fits. So that looks like it would work. Why? And then you just ask yourself why. Mm. Um, and I think you can learn a lot that way. Yeah. It's interesting. A lot of the best advice, like that was a great, um, you know, bit of feedback and answer there because it's, it seems to be trying to train your intuition a lot of the time with composition. It's not something where right. you can necessarily rely on the golden rule. And I don't know whether you've heard this story about Norman Rockwell, who heard of the golden rule later in his career and started to impose it on his own work and then purposely started to shift things out of the thirds and realized mm -hmm. it didn't make much of a difference so long as he was happy with how it was composed. And so long as the piece was resolved, he didn't feel it was struggling. 
So he he found it to be more of a guide than a kind of golden rule or or you know uh yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 I mean Does yeah it's a great guide yeah is there anything which you do where you kind of play with color composition where you'll know that the certain interplay between colors have the uh, different effect on atmosphere and on the the viewer's experience of painting is that something you've ever played with at all because obviously colors are a really powerful thing when laid again you know as soon as the white's covered up everything shifts and then you can really play around is that something that you you use at all no color for me has been i think always intuitive i don't try to use like color palettes to me it it, it if you're laying out like a color like color scheme to me it feels far too illustrative for me um but i'll tell you one thing that i did do is in the last like five years that's really shifted how i view color as taking psilocybin mushrooms i've done that quite a bit in the last few years and that hasn't i feel like has intuitively shifted my color like there's ways of approaching, you know, because it's such a very intense experience and it's all color. It's all about color. Um, so it's shifted ways in more that I think about like relationships of value or color towards value. Like if I really want to push a color, I mean, it seems very obvious cerebrally, but it didn't to me emotionally. Like what are the relationships to black in these colors and how does that push a color, you know, in a composition, things like that um or or that I think about more but I guess that's w one of the few things that I really feel more or that's intuitive to me as a color that's interesting you know you're the second guest to mention mushrooms having a positive oh really yeah a, a chap called Alex Fultz really nice guy in um right I forget where he was Georgia I think he was in um was talking about uh how mushrooms helped him elevate his experimentation with his subject matter because he was well into landscapes he does a lot of portraiture and pet portraits and then he also does this experimentation where it kind of just frees him up into his imagination a bit more in his painting so the idea that it yeah. helped this appreciation of color is really interesting because that seems a bit more of an abstract concept as well so it, like you said if there's more intuition builds is that something yeah. where on several kind of sessions of mushrooms you kind of engage with the color and it would be on a different kind of cognitive level than you do when you're sober or something does that make sense yeah oh yeah yeah does, absolutely yeah like i remember the the first time when it, it really hit and this i had this experience about saturation again these things are hard for me to verbalize it like it's a very internal thing mm -hmm. but i was in um in the netherlands and I'd taken it and I was in my friend's studio and he was working with neon and your eyes become so sensitive to color that the neon was literally hurting my eyes. Like I could not stand it. It was a pain. And we we're in this studio where there was a loft on top of it. And so I had to go upstairs because it was dark up there to let my eyes rest. But then in there, I was looking at all these other paintings and in the dark, I felt like I could see them. And so it like really internalized this relationship of like saturation and the emotion to it, mm -hmm. because being like I was in this dark loft all alone, seeing these very like muted tones. And then downstairs, there was kind of this party with all these neons and these bright lights I couldn't stand. And it, yeah, it just makes these connections that normally I wouldn't do sober or, you know, too cerebral. It was more yeah. of like an thing and then um yeah over time I what I'll do now is here in Oakland they've legalized it so you can get it in microdose so you don't have to blow your mind out so yeah. you take a few and I'll look at my paintings or I'll look at books of paintings and just kind of try you understand that color just a little bit better I don't know I'm really bad at explaining it I apologize it's no no it, it makes sense to be honest when we're talking I'm going to be putting on top of the video your reels and images from your account so that'll help visualize what we're discussing okay. as well which would be nice um but yeah that's I, I, I oh sorry go ahead sorry. please no please i was just going to move on anyway what were you going to say uh i would say one last thing i think it it really does help with too and it's kind of something you're saying about the other gas is um you it's a complete abandonment of of all your preconceptions and everything you hold on to like that's why i think they is slightly tangential but 
the reason why they legalize it here is for therapeutic uses, which I've done as well. And there's something about that drug where you just get a complete abandonment to like whatever emotion you're clinging to or any preconceptions you have about something. Mm -hmm. So that just in looking at art in general with that, it helps get rid of all these biases that you may have in your head, you know, that you're not even aware of. It's just completely clear way to to look at things yeah the uk hasn't quite caught up with the states on that yet but that is uh i think that would be a great benefit for a lot of people because as you said a lot of subconscious bias and cultural uh biases are able to be put into question when uh when you've had your mind opened in one way or another and that would be nice yeah. that would be always beneficial isn't it so that's nice to know um yeah i suppose I'd like to ask about this. It's a bit of a left turn. So sorry, this doesn't really segue very naturally. But you have on your Instagram, um, I think it's Art Savoir Fair Brushes. Is that a sponsorship that you have? Yeah, I work with them uh, in some materials. It's like a very loose thing. It's more of like a, a feedback. Like they'll send me things or send me paints every now and again. And then just say like, what do you think about it? How does it work for you? So sometimes it's brushes, like they work with uh, Raphael brushes, I think mostly, mm. or um, they'll send like oil sticks. That's when I started playing around with those, like, and then colors of paints and stuff. How did that come about? How did you establish that relationship with them? Man, how did that? it's been a while. I They reach out to me like some odd years ago. And it was just like a, for like a couple of tubes of paint, I think. And then when I moved to France, the very first uh, shop is there in Paris by the Seine. So I met with one of the reps, um, he's a French guy named Pierre. He just happened to be, he's all over the place, but he just happened to be in Paris on a business thing. So he's wanted to connect and give me a tour. And that kind of really solidified the relationship because I got to meet everybody and see the the shop and learn all these things about the company. And I love their paints. So just over time, to just send more stuff or every once in a while, I can be like, hey, can I get some of this? Mm. So it's not like a, I would say like a a solid brand ambassadorship, is that what you call it? Yeah. But yeah. it's like a, a relationship that we have where I'll just get things every once in a while. That's great. No, that's always great to know how that comes about and yeah. whether it's circumstantial, like in your case, or through other means, it's always interesting to see how these kinds of things can be mutually beneficial um the other thing i was kind of wondering as well is that um when it comes to your subjects in your work how do you choose those and do you have models sit for you or do you use photo reference how do you actually uh work in that way um it's changed over time so when i was living in france and then just before that i was traveling a bit or quite a bit before that and it turned into just people I was meeting along the way. And when um, when I want to paint somebody, or at least then, uh, I yeah, I have to have some sort of relationship. Like we have to have like a conversation or something. I can't just hire somebody and, and paint them. Um, so there would be times when somebody would look interesting, but there was no connection. So I'd be like, ah, I can't paint this person. Mm -hmm. So uh, all those paintings from maybe like 2016, to 2019 that three years are almost i see them as like visual diaries those are just people i was meeting like during traveling um so i'd meet somebody if they were interesting to paint you know first you always start with like some features usually that that are interesting and then i would have coffee or maybe go out for lunch or something and i'd have to spend at least a couple of days with somebody mm -hmm. and and it would depend on their schedule. Like, it, is it time to paint from life? Because I'd love to do studies from life. Or can they only do for like a photo session? Um, and then that's shifted now just because of circumstance where I think the last uh, number of paintings I was doing was a hired model. Okay. And is it the same you need to establish a kind of rapport or see something which is interesting in the model? It's a little, yeah. It's a little bit less than that because because I'd almost say like, it, it, I don't want to say concept because it's not quite a concept, but that was kind of the concept before. And now I'm kind of in this shifting phase. So, yeah, I mean, I'd have to get along with the person. Like I, I met a, a girl that I, I hired um, some odd months ago 
and we happen to really get along. And I think that really helps. If, if it was somebody that was like, you know, you completely do not gel with, then I wouldn't be able to paint them for mm. sure. It'd be um, interesting to see what happens though. If it's contentious, it could be could yield an interesting, you know, brush. Interesting. To- <laughs> could be terrible. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've always I just, it. for me, I just wouldn't have that desire. I'm like, ah, man, that person's a dick. I don't want to paint him. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I think it's because I, I I had a painting tutor in art school who would talk about. Um, he told us this story once about uh, someone who's leaving a note for the milkman. Uh, again, dating myself a little bit here because we used to have milkmen leave milk bottles at the door. Uh, it's not something we had for a good few decades, yeah. but um, but yeah, so. One day, leave a note for the milkman, you know, two pints are semi-skimmed and you leave it at the front door in the basket. And then the next day you're running late and you're leaving the same note, but you're rushing it. And he talk, talked about it as far as uh, how you would make those marks, those brush strokes. And he said, that is something that I want you to try and capture is the energy of how you yeah. feel. So I want you to try and do something before we have dinner, but finish by the time we leave for dinner. And you've got a very short period of time. And then afterwards, on top of it, when you've got loads of time, then start to tidy up the mess you've made. And I thought that was a really good lesson. Um, Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But similarly, this is a question I was going to ask. He used to get us to go from big brushes to small brushes so that you make the big gestural marks early on. And then you go, you know, more and more refined as you come towards resolving the painting. Do you have any technique with your brushes? Do you have any preference or practice that you ritualistically find uh, yields sound results? Um, yeah, stay. Oh, what was it? This is something I did take from school. That was something I hold on to a lot. And how did they put it? It's like use a brush that you think is just going to be a little too big for what you need. And I've always stuck with that. That's what works for me. So I'll find like, I mean, for sizes I work in, well, now I'm working larger, so I use a lot bigger brushes. But like in standard, like if you're not more than like 36 by 48 or maybe just small, 30 by 40, I'll use a 12 and a 14 for like the vast majority of the painting. And at times even that's too small. But for the face, like if you're a head, like I usually try to keep heads like around eight inches. I think it's a good size or just under. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, is with a 12 for as long as possible, then that's the way to do it. Like for me. So, and I'll use flats. So Jen, I'll have, and I use a number of them. So I'll have like, you know, six, I do them. Cause I think like light and shadow all the time. So it'd be like, I always use an even number. So like eight twelves, and that'll be the majority of the painting for different colors, different values, you know? Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, cause we'll have a range of different viewers and listeners from beginner okay. to advance. So for anyone who's beginner, why would you say that is beneficial to use a bigger brush than you need? What What's the difference that you're getting benefit from there? There's a lot of things. I think part of it depends on what you're envisioning the outcome to be. So I like a looser style and an express, more expressive style and the way you, you see form. I guess there's a bunch of things that I meant. I haven't, I haven't verbalized any of these things in so long. It's kind of fun to talk about it, but I forgot how to verbalize. Um, how you see form and how you think you're going to represent that form. So I see form, um, like some, some people see it very curvilinear or arabesque, and I, I see it very sculpturally, sculpturally and in shapes, solid shapes. Um, and that's how I like to paint it as well. I don't blend at all. I just lay down. So that's why a flat and that size works good for me because otherwise things will look labored, you know, like, like an example, I had an instructor tell me once, he's like, okay, if I put you in front of a six by eight wall and you need to paint it solid white, and I give you a number four bristle brush or, um, a roller, what are you going to use? I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that's another thing that stuck with me. So all the time, that's the way that I think. And if it's slightly bigger, um, that's another way of just keeping it looking less labored. It tends to be more fresh. And you learn how to um, lo- use the brush better, at least for me. Like, it's not just a flat lay it down. It's like, okay, 
So I have a, a 14 and this shape is just a little bit smaller. So I have to figure out a way to angle that brush so that I can get this in a stroke, you know, and for me, it just works out more expressively. That's the way yeah. that I approach it. And, you know, Take small it. brushes, it's like we call it licking. If you're like, you're doing this, there's just so much that can go wrong. It looks labored. Your colors get muddy. You know, it's just unnecessary. I've never heard it being called licking before, but that immediately made sense. So it was a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we used to call that in school. We'd make fun of each other. Be like, oh man, you're licking. <laughs> we used to, uh, licking and scumblers. Scumblers we used to yeah. use too. So it's so nerdy, but like scumblers with people like it's basically licking, but you're using the side of your brush and you scumble the paint. Like, oh man, you're a scumbler. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've never heard it derogatory before. I've heard scumbling is a technique, but you're a scumbler is great. That's a great uh to me, to a yeah, it was like blending like the whole yeah. school like we, we did teach more of an in an expressive style i guess even though it was very technical like the director of the school one of the greatest things classes i'd ever taken in my life and i took it like three or four times it was so good is he had this class called quick studies where you paint we had paintings that were was it 10 minutes 20 minutes and 40 minutes and that's all you get for a painting. And of course, you're doing small at first, nine by 12s and things like that. Um, and then um, we would do that, like in everything in still lifes. We go on location, landscape painting, doing figurative that way. And what it teaches you is people get the wrong ideas like, oh, man, it teaches you to paint faster, which is a byproduct. But it teaches you abbreviation. And I guess that's another thing going back into why using that big of a brush is... It, it, you don't need all that information, right? For paintings, like the best paintings, in my opinion, well, it's not in my opinion, like it, the brain operates that way, that there are abbreviated and you have to leave something for the viewer's brain to put together. Otherwise, it, there, you know, there's, sorry, I'm going to ramble for a second, but there's this guy, V.S. Ramachandran, that I really love. He's a, um, a, a, a neuroscientist. I love, yeah, I love V.S. Ramachandran. Oh, you know him? I do. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. Yeah, the phantom it, limb syndrome. Like split brain patient. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Now you're the only person that I've come across that knows his work. His lectures are amazing. Yeah. You know, and when you look at that, like what he what he talks about, how the brain where the areas that light up, piecing things together, yeah. you know, and it's interesting to see where that came from evolutionarily, but you you engage the viewer in the artwork. And yeah. they, they have to do work and they become part of the painting. Mm -hmm. So that's why I see that abbreviation, you know, is like their brain's like, oh man, that shape, this shape, without them knowing it, right? It's like, that's a cheek or that's a car, these yeah. two shapes and you're engaged, you know, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. I, was, I mean, it does take a lot of confidence and experience to use an economy of marks like that. And I think that is a lot of the strength in professional painting where you can see it's not been you know as you said overly labored so therefore it's kind of has this kind of poetry to it where it's it's just laid on there and you can see the layers almost in you know semi-transparency where there's no uh, kind of muddiness left behind Does that makes sense you know it's kind of all yeah yeah absolutely kind of just sits comfortably um before it gets too late, I want to start talking to you about your relationship with galleries. Do you exhibit in many places? And with you being a, someone who travels, do you exhibit in other countries? Yeah, so um, I'm doing more or less and less. I say more or less. I do less and less with galleries now. Like I did that for a long time, starting in, it was like 2013, I think. I started working with galleries. And then there was this explosion like around 2015 um, of the way painting was. And, you know, they, there was that guy, John Seed, who coined it disrupted realism, like that became big. So then was working with a lot of galleries at that point, and then things started to die off. And then the internet and Instagram. Uh, so long story short, I'm shifting away from that quite a bit of working with galleries. Plus, I'm shifting as an artist, and what I want to do is different it doesn't it's not very conducive to galleries i think at the moment um so i work with one gallery intermittently here in the us which is harman projects in new york 
and then yeah i work mostly with galleries now if i do um in europe right now and then i told you i was just in mexico so i met a couple galleries there and so mm -hmm. i may be doing that but i i can see myself and i think a lot of artists maybe just one gallery down the road and then just doing the rest independently so is this because your work is becoming less commercially viable or is there some other reason why galleries are less conducive to your current um, motivations, let's say? Um, for me, I don't know. I think it's, I'm becoming more interested in the mo the DIY model, just doing everything yourself. Um, working with galleries is great. And like I said, I, I'll continue to do it. Um, but there's not, at, at a certain point, you realize there's not the freedom you want or you'll get pigeonholed. So like I said, like, yeah, a lot of, I, I wouldn't say like my work isn't commercially viable. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. Um, but I really was feeling pigeonholed and I want to do different things, you know, as an artist and not just in painting, like I told, like I've been doing screen printing, been wanting, I have ideas for installations and all these things I wasn't able to do in galleries. Um, because that's that thing you when you establish yourself as one thing then that's the one thing people want galleries want so it's hard to break out of that yeah um, and and it's just more fun like in in mexico uh well what i've been doing a lot of murals in, in a number of years the last few years i enjoy doing that there's more freedom in that um and in mexico uh, there's a lot of collectives artists working in these collectives and I love that. It may not be financially the best way to work, if that's your concern, but artistically, it's amazing, like having these temporary spaces and be able to create an intervention there, um, to me, is really attractive. Yeah. Now, that would be, I could see your work on a mural. He's, my brother's a mural artist, and, you know, I see some. Oh, great. Really, yeah, he's fantastic. I'll send you a link after the meeting. Please. So I like him. Um so yeah, I mean that's that's definitely going to be interesting to see how that unfolds because obviously if it's going to be are you considering collaborating with these collectives and sharing wall space so that you're all kind of almost creating this narrative on the wall is that is that going to happen do you think eventually yeah like I it's so cliche I was telling a friend the other day like so I was in two months in Mexico and I just had this completely like life changing experience you know where some people would be like you know, the, the spiritual experience that kind of just, I guess I had a lot of things in my head that I hadn't worked out yet. And this allowed me to work those out. Um, so to answer your question, I do have like a long-term goal for that. So I, I have this project I'm working on right now that I'm shifting into like short, midterm, long-term goals. And one of the long-term is a collective where you collaborate. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to establish that in Latin America, Mexico and Argentina fantastic now you don't have to answer this but because you mentioned it if it's too personal don't answer it but what was the catalyst for your spiritual experience because that's quite interesting oh i don't mind talking about it um it, it actually wasn't painting it was uh surfing um i since high school i've i've surfed on and off um but i man, i've gone like eight years without it and uh we i was at a residency in Takis and we were working like mad for like five weeks. It was like no days off. We had this exhibition. Uh, it's Mexico. There's a lot of drinking of mezcal. And I was just like burnt at the end of it. And I'm very introverted. So my, my recharge is to be alone. So I got a plane ticket. Oh no, we were at a beach. That's right. We, we took a, a, a few days off or so I went to a beach and I just sat in front of the water and I was like, man, I haven't, it's been like, few years since i surfed and i've never had the opportunity to surf in mexico so i got a plane ticket by myself to puerto escondido which is a big surf spot and i spent three days there surfing and um i met this guy this local and uh he was kind of showing me out where the breaks and stuff are and uh and then he's really good so he's like giving me pointers like hey man i was watching you. he's like you're really tense man he's like have fun loosen up and all these things like, man, that's how it been my approach in life for so long. And then one day I went out by myself and I just, you just have these experiences. Like it was a really great wave, caught it all the way in. And just that, that rush of energy 
you know, like you're sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, like, well, not middle of nowhere, but, you know, you're out there on the beach and it's dead. It's very contemplative. The wave comes, you hit it. And just all that came together where I just like, I don't know, I can't explain it. I was like, I know exactly what I want to do now in life. Like, not that I'd been floundering prior to that, but I have a new goal. Mm -hmm. And I had all these pieces in my head that hadn't come together yet. And yeah. And then there's more to it, but it sounds corny, man. Like you feel like, you know, you're like, man, I'm one with the earth. And you like all those cliche thoughts and it's cliche, but like when you feel it, it's a different thing. Like yeah. it's amazing when, when you're sitting there, like, cause I, I was really blown away. So the waves, they're amazing, man. And, um, you know, you feel like there's such an energy behind them, you know, literal energy. And, you know, as you're Right, that you're just thinking of all the things that have come together to create this moment, like the 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 winds across the ocean, whatever the tide is at the moment had to do with the moon, all that crazy stuff. So you can have this moment just to ride this wave, and it was just yeah. I swear I was sober, <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting how that can bring such clarity in other areas, and that's to be honest, it reminds yeah. me of V.S. Ramachandran because I think this is parts of the brain that where neurons kind of make connections which were previously not firing in that in that sequence which are kind of aided by certain experiences like that surfing experience of loosening up and losing that rigidity so that you can then have a, just a different vantage point on everything that you do i think that would closely relate to the neuroscience that you see from ramachandra and others i think that's really a interesting way of exploring life that way really you know yeah 100 yeah 100 yeah. sorry there was no question there anyway um, <laughs> uh, no no you word it better than i do <laughs> no not at all i just i agree basically i can kill it um now for anyone who's watching or listening we want to make sure that even though you're maybe uh cutting down on the galleries the gallery that you mentioned which i think you said was um you said it's harman harman's gallery in, I'm in projects in I'm new york projects. so i'm going to put a link for that in the description of this video are there any other galleries that we should send people to that you said that you are working with that you'd like to name that i can then link the moment i don't know if i have anything oh yeah yeah there's um ah, gt gallery in in Biarritz. um i'll send you the link of them they're they're in um bayonne they're one I've been working with. Brilliant. As well. Yeah. And then aside from that online, where should people go to support you, to see your work? If they're not familiar with who you are, where would you like them to go? Uh, Instagram. Yeah, I think that's the best place. Yeah, and it's just my name, John Wentz. Yeah. And you have a website link on there. Do you have a website on there? Yeah, I do have my site. Uh, I think it's .com, johnwentz.com. I don't visit enough. I actually planned on, uh, I'm uh, working on it today to update it. But yeah, johnwentz.com. Um, and I think I'm going to probably be more active there than on Instagram, I mm -hmm. think, for a bit. Well, I'm glad that I got to link up with you on Instagram and I'll be keeping in touch as well because uh, it's a great conversation. I think it might be nice to revisit with you because especially if you're having a transformation in your practice, you know, within a year, I think I'll be reaching out to you again because I've got a co-host who normally sits in with me as well called Richard He'd love to talk to you about, you know, your work as well. So he's missed out on this conversation. He's a bit busy at the moment. So um, what I'll do is all of the links will be in the description of this video and in the description of wherever you get the podcast. Uh, there'll be links in the description there. And we encourage people to go and view the artist and support them. And uh, yeah, I just want to kind of thank you for being a guest on the podcast. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for reaching out, man. This was a really fun conversation. Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you can support the podcast by leaving a like or a comment down below, that would really be great. But what we'd really like is if you're able to leave a review on the podcast channels, wherever you listen to it or download it, because that helps us get spread around the internet so that more people have access to us and able to see what we're making. Also, follow us on Instagram. And we'd really appreciate it if you like and engage with our posts. Help get the podcast better known. Thanks for listening.